Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Linda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and the title of my message today is The Cares of This World. I'm going to be telling you all a lot of stories today. Y'all hang with me. i got to illustrate this point. Let me read you the verses that are about the cares of this world before we start. It's in the parable of the sower. The sower sows the word, and there are these by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and becomes and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirty-four old, some sixty, and some a hundred. For the past three weeks, I've had Minister Billy Williams on the podcast, and he's been sharing with us about a lot of miracles that he witnesses on a regular basis in his ministry. Listening to him talk about using your authority and witnessing so many miracles and things led me to start to listen to more teachings on authority. I wanted to get a clear image of what our authority is and praying and researching, and I began to get some renewed revelation. The truth is, I had some of this years ago, and I shared it in the healing companion as far as healing miracles, but the cares of this world had come in and choked out the word. So let me tell you what happened. Um, Y'all know about the big winter storms that just passed through, well, a lot of our areas, not just mine. And that gave me some extra time to spend in the word and studying. Um, You know, in 2009, when I first really began interceding a lot more and uh, spending some time ministering, because the Lord told me to do that. He told me to go out on YouTube. Then he told me to get on blog talk radio. He told me to start the blog and everything he told me, I did it when he told me to do it. So I was used to being walking in obedience from that. And, you know, I learned a long time ago, God's God's place is first. He has to be first. But in the world we live in, and I'm sure in the world long ago too, it is sometimes difficult to keep that and keep him the priority he is supposed to be and is well worthy of being. Um, I knew a woman years ago that said she was already preaching and her grandma that had helped raise her that she was very close to passed away. Well, she was scheduled to preach uh, when this was going on. I guess the day that or the night that her grandma was sick. And so she didn't go. She said, I'm sorry, you know, y'all, but I can't go. I'm scheduled to preach. And her family thought she was just nuts. But she went on and preached. And God rewarded her. Her grandmother passed away that night into heaven. But God rewarded her by taking away most of her grief. Because she knew that her grandmother would want to put God first. So we have to learn to keep him first. We're going to be talking about all this stuff. I'm just giving you a quick summary. I don't want any of us to be like Samson in the end times, strong in appearance only, not realizing his spirit has left us out of our own neglect, okay? And what earthly relationship could be maintained if you don't spend time with that person? Well, our relationship with God is still a relationship. Our relationship with Jesus is still a relationship, and it must be maintained by spending time with him, which is time in his word or time in prayer or time in worship, preferably all three. Okay, so when we let spiritual discipline slip, we drift away from the Lord's presence and the strength we draw from him. And we let the cares of this world choke out the word. And what happens then is you'll start to, this is how this podcast came about. I was 
praying during the snowstorm for something. I can't remember what it was. I was praying about something. And I was about to declare the scripture. And I couldn't remember it. I could not remember it, y'all. And I can't quote every scripture chapter and verse and things like that. But there are specific ones that I pray often enough that I can remember them. And on this day, I could not remember the scripture. And I was like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Because that's me. That's my fault, okay? When there's a distance between you and God, can I just tell you it wasn't him that moved? No. So I knew it wasn't him that moved away from me. I had let things slip because of the cares of this world, okay? There are many stories in the Bible, and we're not going to go into those, but there are many stories in the Bible where someone slipped, drifted away from God because other things got in. Saul, King Saul became possessed with jealousy over David, okay? And he fell away from God because of that. David was tempted by Bathsheba when he wasn't where he was supposed to be. In the time when kings went out to battle, David was at the castle. And that's how he saw Bathsheba, and that whole thing happened, okay? I have been dealing with some physical things in the last two weeks that are, are at a level that I have never, ever experienced before. Fatigue like nothing I have ever experienced. I'm talking fatigue where you cannot physically stay awake fatigue, and you know that you slept all night. That kind of fatigue. And some other symptoms that I'll tell you about in a minute, which they're not important. The symptoms are not what's important. But I had found that over the past two or three weeks, I'll say, I had been reading the Bible and praying less and less and praying less in the spirit, which is very unlike me. Um, I'm concerned because it's almost spring and I fought a big war against red paper wasp last year. I mean, a terrifying war where 20 of them came into my living room within five minutes uh, with from a hole that would I didn't even know was there. And I literally had somebody over here helping me, a woman that lives nearby to me that helps me at things. And we were watching them crawl through that hole. She spotted it two at a time. And y'all, they were flying at my face. That is really scary. Okay, that is really scary. And if you, I don't know if you know this, but if you crush a wasp, it emits a pheromone that tells the other wasp to attack you. So you don't want to crush one when you got 20 of them in your room, okay? So... You know, you're standing there spraying wasp spray everywhere, and then you got to clean all that up. And you know, it's a very time-consuming thing and very stressful. So I dealt with that last summer and fall. And here we are coming around to spring when the queens come out of the cocoons to nest. And so I've been concerned about that. Um, I, my dog has to have surgery. One of my two dogs has to have surgery next week. I'm concerned about that because of... His age, he's eight years old, and it's not a good thing to go under. Then we had two winter storms hit back to back. Literally, one winter storm warning ended, and like 60 seconds later, the winter storm for the second one began. So I've been through storms before, but I have never, ever been through a winter storm that severe when I wasn't married and had someone to help me. So I was dealing with all of that by myself and trying so hard not to, you know, mess anything up. And then during the winter storms, we had a death in our family. So all of this has been going on the last two or three weeks, y'all. It's been really intense. And I realized thinking about, you know, all the things that Minister Billy Williams was talking about on the podcast that I haven't seen a miracle in probably at least several months. And that's pretty, I'm, you know, I see him fairly often, not as often as he does, but fairly often. So one cold winter morning here recently, just before the winter storm, uh, snowstorms came. You know, I had the fireplace burning, and I had my hot coffee sitting beside me, and I start reading the Word. And just a few paragraphs later, my to-do list begins screaming at me in my mind. Y'all ever had that happen? It was giving me a rundown of all the important things I had to do that day. I, I hadn't even looked at it, and it's just, you know, screaming, hey, you got to get this done, you got to get this done. And I tried to lose myself in the peace of the Word of God because I get great peace from reading the Word. And it just continued to just flash, you know, like a flashing neon sign. And eventually, because I couldn't silence it and I couldn't get into the peace of God, I finally closed the Bible and I started working on the to-do list, okay? And I had stopped saying my nine pages of confession prayers every day and dropped back to about once a week, several weeks back because I'd come to dread it because it, was, it took me so long to say them all. 
And part of that came out of that extreme fatigue that I was dealing with, okay? Now, I wish I could tell you this was a one-time thing, but it's happened numerous times over the past couple of months, but it got really extreme in the last two or three weeks. It's way out of character for me uh, to put prayer, not put prayer in the word the very first thing in my day and do it all because I've been doing that since 2009. And when it kept bothering me and bothering me and bothering me, I began asking the Lord and just seeking him. Lord, am I not being diligent enough? Am I, you know, is this the enemy up to his usual stuff or what's going on with this? I've never had to fight this hard, not this hard for my prayer time. You know, I've always had distractions just like you have being alone and maintaining a household and, and running the ministry. You know, my to-do list always feels like it's a mile long. And some days it feels like it's five miles long. But here lately, um, another aspect on top of the fatigue has made it much more difficult. I have been experiencing very, very pronounced symptoms of osteoarthritis, which is basically old age of the joints, even though I'm only 61. Um, I've heard that people in their 30s can have really serious problems with this. I had received a diagnosis of that in Princeton when I lived there in 2015 or 16, but I didn't think it was that serious. <laughs> it goes to show you I didn't know, you know, anything about it. But let me tell you what it is. One day this week, I could barely walk. And I'm literally mean, I could barely walk across the room, y'all. It's that bad. And I got accustomed to physical pain decades ago. But this is something that I have never dealt with. And... I was not really super surprised I was taking an intense physical attack because I knew I was getting revelation on miracles, and I knew that I was going to talk about that on this podcast. That's what this is really about, but I just need to give you the history of it. So anytime you're going to teach on the miraculous especially or anything that's really going to be revelatory to the listeners, you're going to be attacked, and you're going to be attacked hard if it's a big revelation, okay? So... This week, I had started really pressing in for more revelation. I said, Lord, I want to teach on this. And I've seen miracles. The first time God ever sent me to pray for somebody, y'all, he healed them. The first time. And that was in, like, 1997. I mean, it was like a year after I got saved or something. And he healed somebody of cancer that was on their deathbed. was a teenage boy. And I didn't even know him or his mom or any of them, but my daughter knew him. But... I have seen a number of healings, and I've experienced healings myself. But listening to Minister Billy Williams the last few weeks, y'all, I felt like a ne'er-do-well. Can I just tell you that? And I told him that on the phone. We were talking, and I told him, I said, I felt like a ne'er-do-well listening to you. And he said he's been told that by many other ministers, not just me. So I think God uses him and him walking in such complete authority and just believing God so fully uses him to help convict us that we're not doing it enough. Okay? So knowing that God does not change, I knew that whatever the problem was with me not getting stuff done and not seeing the miracles, I knew it had to be me. So I'm going through the winter storm, and I mean, (laughs) I don't know how many of y'all have lived in your in-houses, but it literally felt like the cold was coming through my walls. I mean, cold, cold. And I have a good heat system. I mean, the The house I'm renting right now has a fairly new heat pump, plus I have the gas log fireplace. So, I mean, I shouldn't have been cold, and I was wearing extra clothes, too, but it's kind of a big house. It's actually a little bit too big to spread out, but God will move me someday. Anyway, y'all would have been very entertained watching me me deal with these winter storms, okay, because I'm a Texan, all right? So it starts snowing, and, you know, snow looks really pretty when it first starts coming down. It looks real pretty, don't it? And where I'm from in North Texas, when we hear snow's coming, you stand at the window because snow stays for about five seconds. It realizes it's in Texas and it stops. That's what happened every year. So if you're, if you stand there at the window and you blink, you're going to miss it. I mean, literally, we just don't get snow in Texas. I guess they got a little this time, but we don't, we don't usually, that snowstorm didn't know it was lost when it hit Texas. So in Arkansas, They know they're not lost. Can I just tell you that? So it snowed and snowed and snowed. Bless my cousin's heart on the Gulf Coast. Y'all pray for her, my cousin Tammy. She was without power. Her water froze up. 
all kind of bad stuff happened at her house. And this went on for days. So I'm drinking my coffee and I'm watching the snow fall and fall and fall. And then it goes faster and faster. And then it's actually starting to accumulate. Well, I wasn't too worried about it accumulating because everybody in the South knows if snow is coming, you go to the store and you buy bread and milk so you don't run out, right? So, of course, I'd done my due diligence and got my extra bread and milk. Well, I have not been through a winter storm anywhere near this severe since I was married to Rick, the father of my children. He was from St. Louis, and he knew what to do with snow. So, here I am. The snow is piling up really fast, and I'm alone. And that meant I had to figure out what to do to prevent any kind of costly damage to the house or my truck or anything like that. And looking at the rate that snow was falling, I figured I didn't have very long to do it. Okay. So I thought about the house and I thought, okay, I got to drip the faucet. So I ran around and set all the faucets dripping. I have a basement. I went down there and dripped that faucet. And I closed the drapes in the rooms where I didn't need to be able to see out. I put extra clothes on so I wouldn't have to run the heat so much. And, you know, I'm taking my dogs in and out in the snow. And we get through the first couple of days and the snow just keeps coming. Y'all, I had over a foot of snow at my house. A whole foot of snow is something an innocent Texan like me should never have to experience in person. Can I just say that? Oh, and did I mention the freezing rain that fell on top of that when I was out in the backyard trying to feed the birds? Yeah. So here I am. I'm a woman without an earthly husband. And I was like, okay, what all do I need to do? And in between praying some rather desperate sounding prayers for help to the Lord, you know, I drew up my faucets. I'm, I'm like, okay, the truck has antifreeze. It should be okay. I'm taking the dogs in and out. You know, we're going out. I finally know why my front porch is carpeted in AstroTurf. I couldn't figure that out when I moved here. Now I know. It's so you can go out there when it's icy. I'm serious, y'all. Who, who puts AstroTurf on their, on their porch? But because that AstroTurf was there, I could stand out there on that and let my dogs just, you know, out on long leashes to go out in the front yard. I've never, ever seen the mail not run on mail days. You know what the Postal Service says, hail, sleet, or snow, we're going to be there. They weren't there. I think the mail came one day the week of the storms. And I don't blame them. But it didn't matter anyway because once it snowed that much, unless you were wearing skis, you weren't getting to the mailbox anyway. Can I just tell you that? So I'm concerned about my truck battery going down. Even though it's a brand-new battery, I drive uh, an F-150. And it goes through at least one battery every two years. It's just hard on batteries. I don't know why. Because I don't, it doesn't have any unusual features or anything. It's not loaded or anything like that. It's just a basic truck. But so a couple of days into the snowstorm, I go out there and I raise the garage door, you know, a foot and a half or so. And I run the truck for about 10 minutes or 15 minutes just to make sure the battery's okay. And then I kill it, put the door down. Well, I had a little bird come in trying to get warm and get stuck in one of my sticky traps that I put out for spiders in a gel trap. And I thought, oh, no, because the last bird that got stuck in a gel trap was in my house, and it killed the bird. I couldn't find it. So I spent about 20 minutes trying to free that poor little terrified bird, and it was a little brown wren. It was the prettiest thing. I did manage to get it loose, and it was alive when it flew away. I I think it had a considerable amount of gel on its feet, but the gel was frozen, so it might have been okay. Anyhow... So I go out there two days later, I think it was, and I thought, okay, I don't want to raise the garage door and let animals in again that I have to free out of the gel traps, so I'll back the truck out. So I raise the garage door, I back the truck out, halfway out the garage door, I get it stuck because I don't realize that because of the freezing rain, there is a layer of ice under the foot of snow on my driveway. And I thought, nice job, Lomax, you idiot. Now what are you going to do? And I just, y'all, I just don't know snow. I'm from Texas. We don't deal with any of that down there. We just don't, you don't ever deal with this down there. It snows a lot in Texas. You just don't go out your house. So, (laughs) and I'm out there and I'm not wearing boots or anything. And I have to get out of my truck into the foot of snow and come back in the house and figure out how to get a vehicle unstuck. I've never had to do that. So I didn't know how to do it. So I check on the internet real quick, grab a pair of gripping gloves Grab a shovel. I don't have a snow shovel, y'all. I've never seen a real snow shovel. I've never seen one. I've seen pictures of them now that I've looked for them, 
But we don't have those in Texas. Well, maybe up in Amarillo, where my niece and my nephews are, but not in Texas where I'm from. We don't have snow shovels. So I got a regular shovel because that's what I had. And I put on boots. Um, I just dress boots because I forgot I had snow boots. And I put on boots <laughs> and a coat. And I go back out there and I shovel all around my truck, make sure the tailpipe's not blocked, shovel under the tires as well as I can. And then I take an entire container of kitty litter and I pour it in all those areas and I get in my truck and I pull it into the garage. Okay, so I've managed to unstick the truck and I'm very happy about that and proud that I could actually do that without help because that's not usually the case. So I didn't back my truck out anymore. Y'all be happy to know that. But um, yeah, snowstorms are not my thing, obviously. We learn, you know, we learn as we go. And in the, these end times, I think we're going to do a lot of learning as we go. I was praying about that that day, and I believe the Lord just showed me, look, you know, that's not the last thing you're going to learn on the spur of the moment like that. So it's God's mercy teaching us things that we need to know, I guess, to survive. But moving right along, so I'm studying miracles and um, standing in authority and things like that because I'm very inspired by all the things that Minister Billy Williams had said on the the three episodes that he was on. And I'm inspired that if he's seeing that many miracles, we ought to be seeing that many miracles. Can I just tell you that? We should be seeing that too. Jesus saw him. The disciples saw him. So if we're not seeing them, it's not God's fault, is it? No, it's our fault. Okay, so that's why we're talking about this today. And so I'm thinking, okay, I've been dealing with this osteoarthritis kind of thing. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not okay. I know God doesn't want anything to get in the way of kingdom work. He doesn't want us walking around in pain, but he doesn't want anything getting in the, because I said, Lord, this thing sits me down where I can't walk. You know, I'm going to be doing good to survive, much less do any ministry work. So, you know, help me out here. Let me get some revelation. And, you know, (laughs) I said, if you will teach me, if you will help me get healed and you will teach me, I said, I'll teach the others. You know, I'll do podcasts on it and stuff and teach the others. And right then the devil jumps in. He said, well, you can't teach on it because you're not healed. Really? Because my Bible says I am healed. Okay? And here's the whole point of this message. You get to choose which one you're going to believe. You're going to believe what the word says or if you're going to believe what the devil says. All right? Get that in your mind right now because that is the question. I don't care what the facts say. The facts may say you have cancer. The word says you're healed. You choose which one you believe, and the one you believe is the one that will manifest. If you say, well, I believe that I have cancer because the doctor said I had cancer and I'm going to die, then that's what you will get. Can I just tell you that? Many people have been healed at the last minute when they were about to die of cancer because they refused to believe the cancer could take them if they believed more that the word said they were healed. You have to believe what the word says about you until you see it with your eyes. Until you, because when you believe it and you speak it, nothing the devil can do can undo it. Because truth will always override facts. Get that in your brain right now. Truth overrides facts. Doctor's reports are facts. Financial numbers on your bank statement are facts. God's truth is bigger than both. Okay? All right. And the devil will tell you, well, you haven't done this yet, or you haven't overcome that yet. Okay, that may be true. But if you will look in the Bible, you will see that many of the people the Lord blessed there were also far from perfect, because there are no perfect people. Only Jesus was perfect. All right? And here's another thing. If the devil says, you're not this, or you're not that, or you know, whatever, you don't have this, If you know he can only lie, there is no truth in him, the word says, then what does that mean? That means what he just said was a lie. So if you believe it, you believed a lie. All right? Okay, y'all follow me? Are you with me? If he says, well, you're not healed. Well, you're not, you know, you're not prospering. You're not this. You're not that. The devil can only lie. How do you know it's the devil? Because what the devil says will always disagree with the word of God. That's how you know it was Satan who said it. Because God will never disagree with his own word. He will never disagree with his own word. 
If you hear something that's in disagreement with the word, it is not God telling you that. That's the reason you got to know the word. You got to know the word, y'all. But if you hear something, go research it. If you don't know the, you know, I mean, I don't, nobody knows the entire Bible, I'm sure. But you'll never know any of it if you don't read it and spend some time in it, okay? So God always blesses imperfect people because that's the only kind of people there are. If you will look in the Bible, you will see that David, though he sinned, had a heart for God. The word says that David was a man after God's own heart. So David was a worshiper. If you want to really get blessed, become a worshiper. Let me be very clear about one thing. When I say God blesses imperfect people, I am not advocating sin. You will never hear me advocate sin. I will never, ever do that. I don't believe in greasy grace. I don't believe the atonement that Jesus died in agonizing hours long death to offer us is an excuse to sin it is not a license to sin as many people would have you believe the people who would have you believe that those are people who prefer their sin to him the bible calls those idolaters if you know what you are doing is sin and it you know it displeases god and you still do it then you're an idolater too and i'm gonna speak some truth to y'all you don't want to be there Idolatry will always cost you something that is precious that you can never get back. I am telling you this from experience. But if you will read your Bible, you will see that God blessed imperfect people all through it in various ways with healing, with deliverance, with finances, whatever they needed, with strong relationships. And I, I say finances, I mean people like Solomon, you know, King Solomon, things like that, had great wealth. He gave Abraham great wealth. He gave David, King David, great wealth. God's nature is abundance. He is not a skin flint. He is not stingy. If he withholds the finances from you, it's usually because you, he knows you're going to use it on the wrong thing, okay? And I do not, let me just explain myself as I go so y'all understand. So I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. And so many people listen to me and other people who preach the word just trying to find something wrong with it let me tell you you don't want to do that when you go put your mouth on the people of god god will come for you you better watch out i do not mention finances because i'm about money anybody who listens to me for very long you know that and i will tell you if your goal is wealth you won't go into ministry for a career okay let me just let me just say that but let's look at some of the things the word says Third John 1, 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers, even as thy soul prospers. What makes your soul prosper? When you are walking closely with God and you're living a righteous life and you're trying to get away from, be away from sin, you're trying to do the right thing, that is when your soul is prospering, okay? Deuteronomy eight eighteen. yes, it's Old Testament, but all the word of God is true. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth. That word wealth means might, power, riches, and strength. That he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. God made that covenant thousands of years ago. It is still in effect. Can I just tell you that? Okay? So, if he is trying to establish his covenant with you, then he has also given you the power to get wealth. Do you hear me? That means God made that covenant with mankind. That means anybody that believes in him, he has given you the power to get wealth. That means what that means not is not that you need to, you know, try to get that and become a millionaire. What it means is you don't have to live in lack or poverty. That's what it means. Okay. It means he wants you to have a life of plenty. He wants you to be blessed and then blessed enough that you can bless other people with your substance, okay? But the next verse after the verse about getting wealth says, And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods, which is what? Idolatry. And serve them and worship them. And what is worship? Something that you spend too much time, money, energy, and attention on. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. And let me just remind you of Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Okay, 
All that we ask or think could be referring to finances. It could be referring to healing. It could be referring to living a life of peace and serving the Lord or building up, you know, God raising up a ministry through you. It could be a lot of different things. But what those verses mean is God has already given every believing person the power to get wealth if they remember God, if they are not in idolatry, walking after other gods. Why? Because he is a covenant God and he continually establishes his covenant with us, okay? This is not blab it and grab it, okay? This is not what this is about. This is about decreeing what God has told you is already yours. It's already yours, okay? So it's not blab it and grab it. Blab it and grab it is saying something you don't have to try to call it in. This is saying something God said you have, which means you're just repeating what he is saying. You're doing what Jesus did when he said what he saw and heard his father doing. Okay? All right. So keep that in your mind. Job twenty-two twenty-eight: Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. As we speak, this is how we decree, we speak it. What we see in the word, it is established unto us, and light shall shine upon our ways. Isn't that nice? Let me read you some of these verses around that in Job 22. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity. Iniquity is the tendency to sin. Far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. That means plenty, a lot. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. For then shalt thou have, de have thy delight in the Almighty, your delight will be in the Lord, and shall lift up thy face unto God. That's like worship. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he will hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Paying your vows means if you told a ministry, okay, I'm going to tithe you for the next year, that's a vow. You vowed that you were going to tithe them for the next year. You need to keep that vow. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. When men are cast down, then thou shalt say, there is lifting up, and he shall save the humble person. Okay, so all of this is in agreement with what we're talking about, okay? Job is one of the wisdom books, like Proverbs. They're both in the Old Testament. I have found, I love the book of Proverbs, always have. I have found Proverbs to be just as true today as it was over 2,000 years ago when it was first written. All the word of God is true, period. Okay? So let me read you some healing scriptures. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Strengthening and healing, you know, go together. Jeremiah 17, 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Jeremiah 33, 6. Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. 1 Peter 2, 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. If you were healed, then God already healed you, then you should be healed. Okay? We all should be healed because he says we were healed. And his word is never wrong. God doesn't lie. He can't, it's not even possible. If he told a lie, the whole world would disappear. Isaiah 53, 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Okay, so you got, in the Old Testament, you got present, we are healed. And in the New Testament, you've got past tense, you were healed. So you have both. James 5, 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Psalm 103, 2 to 4, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's actually two. James 5, 14, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Why the elders? Because they know how to pray. You want to really ha hear some powerful prayers, go up to the elderly people in your church, the people who have stood through a lot of stuff. Those will, you will find those will be people who know how to pray. 
Third John 1, 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. And I looked up those words prosper and health, and they mean exactly what you think they mean. Prosper means to prosper and have plenty, and be in health means strong, solid health, being healthy, even as thy soul prospers. So, I said all that to say this. If this is what the word of God says about us, why then are we saying anything else? Why? That's why I'm not claiming osteoarthritis. Okay. I said, I got a diagnosis of it. I said, I've had symptoms manifest of it. Well, let me tell you why, because the stench, (laughs) that's what minister Billy Williams calls Satan. And I like that name. So I've taken it up because the stench Grinch, the stench, the Grinch has convinced us something else is true. He has convinced us of a lie. It's him who told us we're not healed. He has told us that we're poor, that we don't have enough. He has told us that we will never get ahead, that we will never own our own home, that our child will never get saved, that we can never have the favor of God. Blah, blah, blah. Years ago, when my mother was alive, God rest her soul. One night in 2006, I was praying and crying out to the Lord about mom not having her own home because she had, that's all that she had really ever wanted. Besides, she wanted to be happily married, she wanted to have kids, and she wanted to own her own home. She had wanted that for so long, and it broke my heart that she didn't have it because then she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Living instead in a low-income apartment, which, though nice, was not her own and was not God's best. Do you agree that, that a low-income apartment is not God's best for a decades-long moral saint of God who constantly testified of Jesus. I mean, mom was very grateful for it. Don't get me wrong. And I was very grateful she had a safe and clean place to be, but I would have loved to have seen her had her own home. So I was asking the Lord, Lord, what's up with this? And he answered me that night. He answered me with a vision as well as a word, but it broke my heart. The vision was mom was sitting in her chair and I would see this great joy. She was, she, mom, my mom watched preaching all the time. That's what she watched on TV all the time. She watched preaching and I saw her sitting there, you know, watching preaching and she started to believe for a house and she was all joyful and she was all happy. And then I saw a stench of smoke start coming out of her mouth and the Lord spoke then and he said, I do desire to bless Margaret, but her words are stout against me. And keep in mind, too, my mother was a faithful tither. She had a lot to stand on to receive her own home, okay? Malachi 3.13, your words have been stout, which means strong, hard, severe, and grievous against me, saith the Lord. Yet we say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Malachi 3 is the tithing chapter, y'all, if you don't know that. I wonder now, what would have happened if mom's words had been in line with God's will all that time? What kind of house would she have ended up in if she had spoken what God says about her, that she is prosperous, she's in health, she has plenty, and that as, you know, I found scriptures for a house because y'all know I believe for a house for years and years. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, I think it's in Genesis, that says, and the midwives feared God and he made them houses. He made them houses. Plus, The Israelites who came through the wilderness and went through all that, when they got to the other side, God gave them lands that they didn't buy. He gave them vineyards they didn't plant, and he gave them houses they didn't build. Well, if they came through the wilderness and got that, aren't we entitled to the same thing? God's not, you know, he's not, he don't play favorites. So I'm just saying. So yeah, when I started believing for a house, I'm looking for scriptures for houses. So anyway, he showed me this vision. And I was just, my heart was just broken because I had been working for a long time to get mom's confession in line with what she wanted and to not speak negative. But she, people who are negative all the time have suffered great disappointment. And I, if you get around somebody that's negative, nothing positive ever comes out of their mouth. They just keep declaring misery and misery and misery and failure. And as long as they declare it, that's all they'll get. So I say that to say this. Let us declare and decree together, starting right now, we cry foul at the devil. We cast down every high and lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and his holy word. We say no more stench, 
Not today, stench. Stench the Grinch. Not today. From this day on, let's commit together to only say what God's word says about us, that we may do all that we can to allow God to do all his good pleasure in our lives and to give us whatever he wants to bless us with. Let's don't have our words be stout against God where we can't receive healing and we can't receive a home and we can't receive, you know, you can talk all day long about how your kids are not saved. If you tell 20 people that your kids aren't saved and then you pray for five seconds, oh God, save my kids, guess which one's going to ride? Guess which one's going to win out? Which one's going to override the other one? The one you said 20 times. Do you hear me? Do you want to see your kids saved? Do you want to see your health restored? Then you better line your words up with what God says about you. Because that's the only way you're going to see that. It is the only way. I believe that we have authority we have not even begun to tap into, y'all. If you look at how Minister Billy Williams has seen so many miracles, and I'm sure that he receives miracles too in his own life and in his family's life. If we are not seeing that, then the fault lies with us. It never lies with God. It lies with us, and we need to straighten that out. Miracles are for the reason to help unbelievers believe. And if we're not doing our part so God can do miracles through us, guess who failed? It wasn't God. The miracles that happen through you may be the miracles that God uses to convince the unsaved people that you've been praying for for 25 years. Okay? I just I want to close with a prayer for us, all of us, because I'm working on this too. Lord God, I lift every listener to you right now. No matter how, late, how long after this podcast they listen to this, I lift them up to you right now. And Lord, if they have a heart to believe, if you have planted faith in their heart, which I believe you've given to every man a measure of faith, then I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to get a guard over the door of our lips and that you would help us to remember and be mindful every moment that our words are either life or they are death. And I pray that you would help us to make sure that they speak life and that you would help us to remain silent anytime the devil is trying to get us to speak against our healing or speak against our finances or speak against our children being saved or speak against anything that you are trying to do for good in our lives. Help us to just be quiet, Lord, when we need to be quiet. Help us, Lord, to be the examples of your miraculous power to those we love and to only speak life. Because we need to set the example for our families. Help us to be diligent, Lord. Help us to keep our spiritual disciplines in line. To spend our time daily in your word. To spend our time daily in prayer and interceding for the lost. To remember to pray for our leaders. Whether or not we particularly like our leaders. Or agree with everything they do. Unless we pray for them, how can you change them? Help us to remember, Lord God, to lift our leaders up in prayer every day. Help us to remember to lift our families up in prayer every day. And help us to go about, Lord, decreeing the thing and speaking the blessing and not the curse. And Lord, I pray that you would convict every listener when they speak a curse out of their mouth, when they speak something negative about their own life, Lord, including me, Lord. If it starts to come out my mouth, Lord, show me, Lord, so I can just stop it before, it, before I speak it. We don't want to decree misery. We don't want to decree sickness. We don't want to decree poverty in our lives, Lord. We say it stops now. It stops now. And we say, Lord God, make us aware when the stench is trying to get us to curse our own blessings. In the mighty and matchless name of my Lord and Savior and King, Jesus Christ, I ask it. Amen. Thanks for listening. Y'all be safe out there. And remember to watch your words this week, okay? Let's do this. Let's give God avenues to bless us. And let's not let our words be stout against him. Y'all have a great week. Jesus bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. You can contact me by mail at my new address. JPH Inc., Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 60, Glencoe, Arkansas 72539. 
or by email at jphtoday at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Sidewalk Flowers Volume 1 is a collection of 58 short inspirational readings that will uplift, comfort, and encourage readers from every walk of life. Sidewalk Flowers includes inspirational tales and topics taken from the lives of everyday people who exhibited extraordinary wisdom, kindness, and courage while traveling the sidewalks of life. Get your copy of Sidewalk Flowers Volume 1 today, available in print and new audiobook. Sidewalk Flowers Volume 1 by Glenda Lomax, available on Amazon.com, in print or new audiobook. There is no one on earth who has not been wronged at some time in their life. Everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has been hurt by someone. The pain you have suffered does not make you special. It is what you do with that pain that sets you apart. Life can make you bitter or it can make you better. You choose. The only difference between the two is the I. Do you know someone who is going through a wilderness season right now? Have you heard about the Wilderness Companion Study Guide? It's a workbook with 41 lessons, including new stories from the wilderness and questions to help you work through your own wilderness experience. Read each lesson. Then complete the questions to apply the lesson to your own wilderness experience. Get your copy of the Wilderness Companion Study Guide today and get one for a friend. Available now on Amazon.com. The Wilderness Companion Study Guide by Glenda Lomax. Available on Amazon.com. What is in store for the once great and mighty nation of America in these end times? What is the living God saying to the people of America now? What could possibly be in store for a nation that once trusted in God, but has changed its path from following in the living God's ways to now removing Him from everything and walking the other way? In the book, No Longer Mind, you will find all the messages to America collected in one place in chronological order. No Longer Mind, Messages to an Unrepentant Nation is now available in print at wingsofprophecy.com in the bookstore tab. Get your copy of No Longer Mind today.